Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think we can get started with, uh, with this uh, keynote presentation, which is going to be about power to X uh, in the global economy. It will be given by Professor Ingo Stadler, uh, who is a researcher and a teacher at uh, the University of Applied Science in uh, Cologne, in Germany. Uh, and his topic is uh, mostly on uh, renewable energy integration and energy economics. Um, Professor Stadler completed his PhD at the University of Kassel, also in Germany, and now, as I said, he's in Cologne, uh, also involved in the Cologne Renewable Energy uh, Institute. Um, his work focuses on grid integration uh, and also what we will see, and which I think is very interesting, uh, non-electric storage and load management. Um, it's also, since we are in South America, it's also useful to mention that he's involved in various projects in uh, Brazil. He has been involved for more than 20 years, uh, in particular with the University of uh, Fortaleza. And on a more uh, personal note, I have to say that uh, I remember a presentation from Ingo back in 2011, uh, I think. And by the time, I think it was the most convincing presentation I've seen on sector coupling. It was so convincing that it has become one of my research topic uh, since then. So, uh, Ingo, please, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, let's give him, let's give him a warm applause. Thank you very much, Sylvain. But don't say that that was in 2011. It shows how old I am. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, here in the... Uh, in Wiener del Mar, and also welcome to those who are listening via the Stavis YouTube channel here live. I hope so. And <clears throat> when you look to my first slide, you might wonder about that strange photo. I thought, <clears throat> which illustration could I take uh, for that title with Power to X and South America? And then, ah, why not asking artificial intelligence? And uh, I entered the title into the dreamstudio.com, and that was the result. That is what artificial intelligence thinks is Power to X uh, and how it does change the global situation. And I thought, I don't understand that, but then I looked closer and it looks a bit mystic. It even looks a bit religious. And sometimes when I go to hydrogen events in my country, I also have the impression, oh, it's more a religion than science. And you meet people there who more look, uh, who follow the smell of the money than really look for uh, technology. And so maybe this artificial intelligence also was in some of those hydrogen events in my country. But uh, to sum up, to sum up uh, my talk, I would say the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. And when I came, I dropped in in this hydrogen topic more accidentally. So I, my job is a bit different, but I needed to work a lot with these topics. And then I read a lot of studies on hydrogen and hydrogen demand in my country. And uh, looking for the hydrogen demand in the year 2050, and then we see some studies have a very high demand and others have a low demand. <clears throat> and there's even a factor of four in between, and we really do not know what will really happen in the future, how much hydrogen we really need. And I think that's the reason there is competitors to hydrogen. And when we look at our energy system, we have the electricity sector, the heat sector, the gas sector, the chemistry sector, mobility sector, and we have storages everywhere. It's not only hydrogen. We have electricity storages like batteries. We have heat storages like just hot water. Or we have gas storages. Today it's natural gas maybe, but in the future that might be the hydrogen. And for sure we can produce chemical products and store them. And in the mobility sector, we have today mainly liquid storages, but in future maybe also battery storages and also gas storages. And now when we talk about the sector coupling, for sure we can use electricity and produce, for example, with a heat pump heat and then store the heat and not using electrical storages. <clears throat> or we can charge our e-cars and have the storage there and maybe uh, also can use the storages in the cars uh, for the 
electric sector optimization. And then for sure we could produce hydrogen and store the hydrogen. And the hydrogen then could go in the heat sector, in the chemical sector, in the transport sector. And for sure we talk about power to chemicals and also maybe power to liquids. So a beautiful, colorful world. And even when we have a high caloric heat, we even could go back uh, to the electricity sector. But what is that great with hydrogen? Hydrogen, you can do everything. Hydrogen is fantastic. You can go and produce heat. You can go and produce electricity back again. You can do power to chemicals. You can use that in the transport sector. And there's even much more big, and that is we even can do trading with hydrogen and hydrogen products. So what can we say? Hydrogen is fantastic. It's a wonderful world. Maybe not from Louis Armstrong, but uh, hydrogen is the new wonderful world. But is it really that wonderful? Uh, or maybe even looking at the hydrogen hype, is it just another pick that is being chased through the village? And this hype maybe will tear down in a few years? I don't know. Definitely, it is a hype. Uh, almost every country in the meantime has a hydrogen strategy. Uh, the European Union has a hydrogen strategy, my country has a hydrogen strategy, every state in my country has a hydrogen strategy, and there are extremely much studies on hydrogen. And all those that I show the cover pages are written in German. When I put here English studies, uh, the space would not be uh, sufficient for that. And then I needed, when I had discussions with my utility in my home, hometown in Cologne, uh, they think we go also have hydrogen to heat our houses. And then I read studies especially going for hydrogen in the heating sectors, uh, like the ones, oppa, that was not a good idea? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, like uh, the ones we see here in the front. And uh, then I wondered, because one of the arguments why we should also take hydrogen for heating our houses was we can store hydrogen. That's the advantage. And then, but why not storing heat when it's about heating sector and using uh, heat pumps? And then I looked for the word heat storage in those studies of hundreds of pages and it even did not appear. And then you need to look who is paying for the study and then you might get a better idea what the idea is behind that. So there are a lot of studies with different interests and that makes me suspicious. Maybe a bit of look back, as you said, and you did not say, but you almost mentioned I'm an old guy, uh, why I am such a suspicious person. And what you see here, that is, when I was a young student in the very early 1990s, um, we students had been full of ideas how we can make our electricity renewable. We went for solar energy, we went for wind energy, and our old professor said, you are so stupid, that never can work with renewable energy. And what you see here is a one page in newspapers our utilities have advertised. And that was to argue why we still need to go for nuclear, why coal is so important. And among others, it is just saying here, sun, water, or wind cannot cover more than 4% of our electricity needs, even in the long term. And that uh, made us young guys uh, suspicious, angry, and we had been fighting against our old professors, and nowadays we know 4% uh, of renewable electricity is almost nothing. Even in our uh, dark and dull country like Germany, we have now more than 50% of renewable electricity, and that was whenever I see such a new hype, such a new topic coming up, that makes me a bit suspicious when people say that is the only future. And let's have a look on different ways how we could heat our 
buildings, for example. We have here on the right side five buildings. They are identical. And on the left side, we have the renewable future with wind and solar. And we want to heat those houses. And then for sure, we can do that with a heat pump um, using electricity and have a very efficient way. Uh, we always use um, solar and wind having some grid losses. And we also could say ah, it's cheaper when we have uh, just electrical resistive heating. Um, also can heat the houses with electricity. Or we can produce and electrolyze a hydrogen, store the hydrogen and burn it in our, boil, uh, in our uh, gas uh, boilers also to heat the house. Or we could produce the hydrogen and store the hydrogen, put it in a combined cycle power plant and use the electricity again to use a high, uh, heat pump. You think that is a, a strange way, but it is investigated in um, some of those studies. Or we could again go for the hydrogen pathway, again burn the hydrogen in the combined cycle power plant, use the electricity to heat the houses with heat pumps, and also use the waste heat uh, in district heating grids. But when that here in the first row, the most efficient one, that will be um, that amount of solar and wind systems we need to power the house, then um, we have an other need when we go for a pure electric resistive heating. And then we need almost 3.5 the amount of solar systems and wind systems. And we need the space for those solar and wind systems. When we go for this hydrogen path, we almost need six times the amount of solar systems and wind systems. And going for the others is 2.8 or 2.5 the times. And that's the question, apart from all the costs we might have in the system, do we really want to have uh, this large amount of solar and wind systems? Do we go for these efficiency losses? The same we could discuss when it's for private transport in our cars. We could again have, for example, four types of electricity paths, and we could go for direct battery electric driven electric cars or maybe we could go for the hydrogen pathway store the hydrogen in the gases way use fuel cells and then again we use an electric motor to drive the car we also can go for a liquid hydrogen pathway and using fuel cells and driving electric motor. By the way, those uh, fuel cell cars also have a small battery involved, so that is not that it's without a battery. Or we can go the dream of some of the old German car manufacturers. We want to go still for our diesel engine, but still become climate neutral. And then we go for hydrogen producing power to liquids, and then we can drive our old diesel cars. They are so beautiful. Again, when that, the first one is the most efficient one, and again, we need this amount of wind and solar systems, then we need more of them in the other uh, pathways. It's maybe three times uh, for the uh, fuel cell car, or even four times when we go for the liquid, and when we go for the power to liquid, um, that we can use our internal combustion engine is even more than five times. And when we say that with the hydrogen people say, oh, but efficiency is not everything. There is other things that is much more important. Efficiency always mattered, but now when we talk about hydrogen, it's not any more of that big importance. And then they say, yes, but you only look on the German country. And yes, when you have the direct electric car, then you need to have the wind system and the solar system in our country. But now uh, take this wind system and solar system and put it to Chile, for example, then with the same investment, you have maybe double the electricity you make out of the system. And then the efficiency is not anymore the big topic. We come back to that later. But from that we see, when we look to those studies, what is the demand in 2050, 
it is just a question which sectors we are really looking at. Do we really go for the private transport using hydrogen or not? And then we have a big difference. Do we go for heating in buildings with hydrogen? Again, it makes a big difference and we will see in future what uh, will win the race. So maybe for the future more realistic, at least I believe that, is that we don't use hydrogen in all the sectors, but maybe there where we do not have really a lot of alternatives. And uh, that was just the efficiency talk. Then uh, what about all the equipment, the electrolyzers, the fuel cells, the storages, and so on? I think you know this expression. And again, I asked uh, artificial intelligence, please draw me a picture. Uh, it's raining dogs and cats, and that was the result. And uh, when we imagine in the future, maybe it is then raining electrolyzers and fuel cells. Uh, and they will be as cheap as in some prognosis we find that. Um, maybe it's a good idea. By the way, the artificial intelligence could not uh, draw a picture. It's raining electrolyzers and fuel cells. That was absolutely nonsense that came out by that. Artificial intelligence does not know what the electrolyzer is so far. Um, when then, when we look to these cost protections, <clears throat> um, I think people who are much more in detail in that than I am, but nevertheless, I am getting suspicious when I see those studies. And for example, here we have the production cost of hydrogen given here in US dollars per kilogram of hydrogen. As I'm not a chemist guy, I always need to transfer that in euro cent for a kilowatt hour, not at a kilogram. And today that study says we are around five dollar for a kilogram and then they project for the future we have 80 percent cost reduction for the electrolyzer what is the cost per day uh, even the electricity cost for the input in the electrolyzer will drop significantly uh, the efficiency is going up of electrolyzers and so on and so on and then we end up in the future with one dollar for a kilogram of hydrogen using another graph from IRENA, for example, and again, that is the prognosis, what is the cost in dollar for a kilogram of hydrogen. And then when we look here to the small numbers here, what they taken as an assumption, and there we see that the electrolyzer cost is in the high lines, 300 US dollar for a kilowatt, and in the low lines, it is only $150 for a kilowatt. And the rest is uh, the difference in electricity prices. And then I think at least the graph starts here in 2020. And which electrolyzer do they use when they calculate with $150 to a $300 for a kilowatt? Um, even when we only talk about the cells, I think we hardly find that. But when we look how hydrogen is really produced, it is much more than just here the electrolyzer cell. Um, and it's much more components. And so when we look, there is a need that we have the power supply for the hydrogen production needs with transformers, with frequency converters, uh, with safety uh, protections and so on. We cannot just use the water that is coming out of a river. We need to also have a processing of the water that we have a long lifetime of our electrolysis. Then we have compressors in those systems that are costly and consuming energy. And the hydrogen that is coming out is also not always pure. And we also need the processing of the hydrogen that is coming out later. And only that small thing here is the electrolyzer cells or the electrolyzer stack. When I look here, that is a company Neumann and Esser, and they at the moment, they sell the container system for the production of hydrogen. And again, we see that here is the electrolyzer, but the complete system comprises of so much more. And 
when I they do not publish their prices uh, for the hydrogen production facilities, but they are multiples of what we can read in studies nowadays. And when we have a photo here of another one, this is from Elogen, also a container system. And again, you hardly find here in the picture where the electrolyzer cell is. There's so much else that is needed to produce hydrogen that I'm not sure whether all those prognoses with beautiful learning curves will be the reality in the next decades. That one uh, is a pilot project in Kaiser Esch. Nobody knows where that is, even the German ones not. It's a small village in the state of Rhineland-Pfalz and they have a lot of wind power, even more than they need. And they said, before we stop our wind turbines because the grid cannot uh, deliver the electricity to where it is needed, then we start to build up a hydrogen business. And again, here you see the photo, you don't see the cell itself. It's a lot of engineering equipment here. And the pure cell is a quite small component in the complete system. And again, I'm not an expert, but when I look to learning curves, and yes, we see this yellow curve here from photovoltaics, and that has a fantastic history, a fantastic story, how cheap photovoltaics have been getting. And when we look to the PV cells, yes, those semiconductor devices, it's a small unit, and we learn to produce them very automated. We have, a ste we have steep learning curves. The cost regression had been fantastic. And we always thought wind turbines would go the same. But the reality is we cannot observe the same learning in wind turbines. And due to many reasons, for example, steel prices even went up, sometimes even the prices for wind turbines increased. And when I look to the fuel cell systems, I ask myself whether, yes, maybe for the component of the electrolyzer cells, I also can imagine in future, they are produced in high quantities, very automated, but all the rest of the system I, it seems to, that it will be a bit of handmade and it is hardly being automated everything. And maybe for the fuel cells we have the same uh, fuel cells. For the electrolyzed cells we have the same uh, learning curves like PV, but for the rest of the system it's maybe more like a wind turbine, a lot of handmade things. So that is what I'm always asking myself, is the cost degression potential really that high for hydrogen production that we always see in those productions? And will we see high learning systems only with electrolyzer cells, but not really with electrolyzer systems? Maybe you can answer that question I am not able to solve or answer myself. It's only the doubts I have. And uh, by the way, please tell me when I only have five minutes left. <laughs> Um, I would like to make a small excursus on the battery market development, again in my country, and it's a bit the same in scientific conferences. I always see a protect projection and also values of battery prices that are used then in energy system simulation that is far away what I see in reality. And I'm using here some figures of a colleague, Jan Figener from Aachen, showing here the battery development in households, mainly attached to PV systems, and then also in e-cars, and there it was until the last year, half of it more or less was uh, plug-in hybrid, only the other half was pure electric cars. But when we not look to the number of cars or number of systems, but in the capacity installed in gigawatt hours, then we see that one. And there we see uh, the systems that are installed in houses with PV systems became absolutely small. And the battery market is now really driven by the electric cars. And that's booming. And I think that is the good chance we all not only solve the problem in decarbonization of the transport system, at least the, the private public transport, uh, but also maybe the electricity sector with that when we do more. And that is now what is the analysis of the battery system prices 
uh, in my country. And then, um, okay, let's forget about the very small systems. But even when we go for those systems up to 250 kilowatt hours of storage, what the end consumer really pays for is not 100 euro for a kilowatt hour. It's not a free 100 euro for a kilowatt hour. It is still close to 1,000 euro for a kilowatt hours. And that is the reality. It is not those beautiful projections of the um, cost degression what we see in so many publications. But when we look now what is going for the vehicle to grid or vehicle to home application, and again looking to what the battery really costs when we want to buy it, and let's say that is a very it's a cheap one, it's 750 euro for a kilowatt hour. And then I was interested in buying an e-car during the pandemics and looking for this Nissan Leaf car. And then I had an offer of 30,000 euros and that included a 40 kilowatt hour battery. And when I divide 30,000 by 40, I end up, oh, accidentally, it's also 750 euro for a kilowatt hour. But in the car, I even get four tires uh, and some seats and uh, air conditioning and whatever you need in such a car. So in cars, there seems to be the prices are getting really cheaper. But of course, it not really works so far with the vehicle to grid, the vehicle to home. Uh, technically, yes, but not from a regulation point of view. <laughs> and, but then we have a completely different development maybe of those prices. And when we look how the battery size develops in cars, and there we have, um, an analysis of how the German people are driving. And when we look only for the single trips, so I go from this point to another point, and then we see that for 95% of the single trips, um, a capacity for 42 kilometers would be sufficient. When they are not assumed the charging possibility, and we say, oh, we need for all the trips we make in a day, then we see that for 95% of all the day trips, we could do with a 150 kilometers battery. So, but what we see in the e-car market is that we have driving capacities exceeding much, much 300 kilometers. And we have capacities of batteries between 50 and now some cars even more than 100 kilowatt hours. Um, that means when we look to that, we can do so much more with those batteries in the cars than just driving. And again, looking just some stupid examples here, we have almost uh, 48 million cars in Germany. And we assume for the future, they all will be electric cars, battery driven cars. Uh, for sure, we hope we will have less cars in the future, have other ways of transportation. But when we assume that would become true, we have here on the horizontal the battery capacity of a single car, and then we have the total installed capacity on the vertical. And when we see that the maximum load, electrical load of the German system, always in a uh, dull and cold November day, is around 70 gigawatt. We could power uh, with an average car battery in, of 50 kilowatt hours more than a day of the peak load. Or when we, have, when we in future all drive Audi e-trons, uh, we even could power the maximum load for three days, assuming starting uh, all the batteries had been charged completely. Or when we look to the average car that only drives 38 kilometers per day, and we assume even a high consumption of 20 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, that is then a 7.67 kilowatt hours per day. And then we see we only need something between uh, maybe 7 and 15 percent of the capacity per day in average. That means that for most people it's sufficient, they only charge the batteries at the weekend, for example. So there's a lot of space to manage when you really charge the cars. So that, I think, uh, will be a good 
something uh, and competitor for hydrogen in the future. But coming back to the energy system, and now we always only look to energy system, but when we go beyond energy, so we always discuss, yes, we have electric grid, uh, we have maybe battery storage there, and then we have a gas grid with gas storages, and then we have sometimes also district heating grid with heating storages. We can uh, interconnect the different sectors. And uh, for sure, we have mobility, uh, maybe gas driven, electrically driven. That is this sector coupling issue. And then now, maybe in future, we also have here the hydrogen or maybe even the ammonia. And then we have another linkage because the hydrogen ammonia needs to be produced by, for example, electricity. And then people started to say, but we have hydrogen demand not only in energy, but we also have that uh, feedstock demand uh, in the chemistry industry, in steel, in fertilizer, and some others. And uh, what to do with that? We never take care about that. That was. We always said, yes, the industries, they need the electricity or energy demand, but that they need others. We even had not on our mind. But when we see then, that is maybe the energy and hydrogen demand. And in future, we also have this uh, consumptions of hydrogen or the need of hydrogen to replace in those industries like the chemical industry, the natural gas and the crude oil. And that also comes from hydrogen or like the fertilizer production, or like the steel that must become a green steel, then, uh, yes, we have higher demand in hydrogen than only for the energy system. And when we need to produce the hydrogen, that also increases then our electricity or energy demand. So there is a new pack coupling in this system. And let's have a look a bit on the fertilizers, for example. It's a giant world market. So it's more than 202 megatons of fertilizers produced every year. And it's good that we are fertilizing uh, our agricultural fields, because here we see this 71 here gigajoule per hectare is when we are not fertilizing. And when we are fertilizing, we see with the fertilizer, the plants can do that much more on production out of the solar power. And only the effort we put in in energy, in ammonia, in urea production is quite small. So it makes sense to do that. And when we look then to the diagram on the fertilizer's production, again, we see, um, Yes, it's mainly done today with coal natural gas to produce then the ammonia. And then quite often I listen that ammonia is used for the fertilization, but the vast majority is urea. And in urea, for example, again, we have the carbon need to produce that. So it's not only hydrogen, it's also a question where we get the carbon from. And it's a big, uh, greenhouse gas emission, this fertilizer production. And it's just accidentally the amount of megatons of CO2 equivalent is more exactly the same number that Germany has as greenhouse gas emissions. So the worldwide fertilizer industry is exactly what we Germans are polluting the world with. And that mainly could be solved uh, with green hydrogen. Uh, and what we need that for is, uh, go back, sorry, um, the green ones here is the nitrogen fertilizers, then we have also the phosphorus and the potassium fertilizers, but from an energy point of view, the phosphor and the potassium fertilizers can be more or less neglected. It's mainly the, um, the, 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 where is it? The nitrogen fertilizer. And yes, some, Ammonia is used directly to fertilize, but when it's in ambient condition, it's a gas, and then they put needles into the earth, and when then the, the soil is wet, the ammonia connects with the water, and then the nitrogen can be absorbed by the plants. But that is a quite difficult job, and therefore, 
we see that the ammonia that is produced for fertilizers, absolutely the most goes in for the urea production here. And then we have some other fertilizers. But the direct application of ammonia is a very small part used in fertilizers. And again, urea, that is too complicated for me as an electrical engineer, but we see there is this uh, C in it. So we have a need also for carbon or carbon dioxide when we go for that. And when we look then how fertilizers are dealt with, uh, we have exporting countries. And when we come then to South America, we see uh, there is one of the Chilean neighbors, it's Brazil. It's the, by far away the largest importer of fertilizer products in the world. But with the green hydrogen may be produced here in South America, there is a very local market, first of all, to get rid here of the fossil fertilizers imported mainly from Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, uh, to produce that here in a local market. And there's almost no competition, I think, uh, with other things. But when fertilizers become more expensive, maybe it's also a chance then that we have more organic fertilizers than in future. And when it's getting more costly, maybe also technologies like precision fertilizing gets a better chance that is too costly today. So not just spraying the fertilizer all over the field, but just by high tech, only putting the fertilizers exactly where the plants are and that we see in some experiments here. We can save up to 25% of the fertilizer. And in the right picture, we see the plants, at, le at least they look very green. So more technology maybe when the fertilizers are getting uh, more expensive. When we go to the cement industry, it's not really a good solution. I think there is not a good solution because a part of it is the heat we need to produce the cement and that we might uh, substitute in future also by hydrogen, but it's only among one third of the energy needed uh, goes into this heat. And the other problem is that we have from the process related emissions, whenever we have this calcium carbonate and heat, we have the cement and then we have the CO2 emissions. So then we might have then this CO2 to use it then in the hydrogen industry, but then it's not a green because it's really additional emissions we have. Or we need, we need maybe to go into the sequestration. Also would like to have a few slides on the chemical industry. And that for my country is a big industry. It's almost 10% of the German industrial turnover coming from the chemical industry and we have almost half a million workers that are employed in that industry. And again, we see then uh, when we go in future to make that climate neutral, uh, that is a study from the German chemical industry to produce all those different products we have. We need hydrogen, we need carbon dioxide, and we use then a lot of electricity to produce the hydrogen, or maybe we import the hydrogen. But how dramatic it is shows that graph from the study. And here they see in the black line how emissions could go down in the year 2050 to zero. But even nowadays, they need a lot amount, a high amount of energy, but mainly to get rid of the CO2 emissions, replace it by green hydrogen, the additional electricity demand will be 600 terawatt hours. And that again, accidentally, is more or less exactly our today's electricity demand. So the chemical industry would almost double the demand of the complete country when we stay with this chemical industry also in future. Now there is a new study and uh, they learned already a bit to reduce then this high demand on electricity when it's not always going everything produced by electricity but also using biomass resource, uh, recycling of plastics for example and then that could be reduced to numbers here um, that is then significantly lower like that 600 terawatt hours a year but it is still really an enormous amount on additional electricity resources. 
And then the final thing is the green steel. There are much bigger steel producers in the world than my country, but nevertheless, it's an important industry also in our country. And with the conventional uh, production, it was always the problem. We have this iron oxide, we add then uh, coke, and then for sure we have on the right side the iron, the pure iron, but also the CO2 that is emitted. So it's not an energy emission, it's just a process emission. And we can get rid of that with the direct reduction plants. When we use, instead of the coke, hydrogen, then we uh, get rid of those emissions. But again, then we have a hydrogen demand that is apart from our demand for energy. And then when we look back to our system, uh, the energy system now has also this feedstock demand. And uh, we can decide to do that all in one country, or we know it's hard to export and import heat and cold, electricity maybe with our neighboring countries, but hydrogen that might be produced somewhere completely else in the world. And depending on what policy, policy makers decide, what it is society uh, allows, and what markets, how markets will develop, maybe the hydrogen or its derivatives are produced somewhere completely else. And then we have even maybe a lower energy and hydrogen demand in a certain country. But as beautiful that looks, uh, then you need to transport the hydrogen. And then it's the question of the energy densities. And hydrogen has a fantastic energy density in terms of weight, but poor in terms of volume and volumes we need to transport. When we looked at when we transport oil products, then the value or the energy density in terms of volume is much, much better. You might, can much better transport oil products than hydrogen in a gaseous form. Even natural gas we see has a low energy density in terms of volume, and that it's the reason why we always have been that lucky to get the gas in pipelines by Russia. When we have the liquid natural gas, we have a better energy density in terms of volume, but still a bit less than the oil products. And when we then say, okay, we need to go away from hydrogen to transport that in future, we might have the liquid hydrogen, but it's still lower than the liquid natural gas, or we could go to liquid ammonia, is still better, but it's still not that perfect to be transported. And even methanol has not the same densities than we have with liquid natural gas or even with oil products. And that is maybe a burden for the trade of the hydrogen products. That is a picture that illustrates that quite well. We see on the right side um, the high compressed hydrogen with 400 bars, and it's almost the same amount of hydrogen like we have on the left side uh, when it's stored in a liquefied process. Or well, here we have a picture of uh, the liquefaction plant in Leuna, or here a pilot project, Hystra, between Australia and Japan to test out um, liquid hydrogen transport and applications. Or we might have then the ammonia that can be transported. And then it's the question, what are we doing in the desti final destination? Do we need the ammonia or can we use the ammonia? Or do we need to spread again to get to crack it, to get the hydrogen, to use the hydrogen? And that might also play a role. But the, as ammonia is a, already today an important player for the fertilizer production, for example, we have already a quite good infrastructure worldwide for ammonia uh, production and shipping. But when we then look to all the beautiful picture of the future, we need to see, yes, for the gases hydrogen, the technology readiness levels, they have the nine, so that is ready for implementation. But for many other technologies, we see here yellow and red parts and that means not necessarily that there is not technology available, but quite often only in small sizes. And that needs a scaling up 
to really meet the demands where all the world is talking about nowadays. So it's not just investing and doing, there is still a quite high development demand. And then again, I think I have shown this slide already on the panel. Thank you. And then we see hydrogen transport. And I skip now the local transport, looking again for the very large distance transport between countries. It is maybe more than $2 for a kilogram of hydrogen that um, needs to be paid. And then I skip a bit because I have shown those examples of transporting hydrogen or dairy weights to different parts of the world. Um, and then we always see it's quite high priced. But for example, looking here from Saudi Arabia to the port of Rotterdam, uh, yes, it's a maybe three dollars for a kilogram. But when I want to have that then in my town, and maybe there is also maybe then a transportation by train or by lorry, we might add another two or one and a half dollar for a kilogram when we have also the last uh, 100 miles transport considered. And uh, that is then about also the leakages. When we have liquid hydrogen, we have the high losses by liquefaction. We have the boil off, but it might be used for transport fuel in ships. When we go for these liquid organic hydrogen carriers, again, we have a high energy demand for the dehydrogenation in the import region with high temperatures required. And when we go for the ammonia, we have a high energy demand for the production in the ammonia synthesis, and maybe then also a high consumption when we are cracking the ammonia, when we are saying we are not dealing with the ammonia, but we want to have the hydrogen back apart from the ammonia. And uh, due to the time, uh, I skipped that. That should be the world of power to x showing that there is, among others, also that need for the carbon. And as carbon is already needed today, but it's mainly out of a fossil supply, we need it in future maybe from um, agriculture, from biomass or residues, or maybe we can capture it by air, but we need it for so many products. We talked about here the urea and maybe also the methanol, but in so many products we find not only the H, we also find the C. For example, when you had a too long party yesterday evening at Stavis party and you need aspirin, also that is not a green product but might be uh, produced in future also by hydrogen and by a green carbon source. And so when we're looking for carbon, we have this direct air capturing and that's the positive. You can do that wherever you are because there's always air but the content of CO2 in the air is quite small and the cost is very high at least today and even the protections for future is not that good. Industrial emissions we should not take into account because it's not green and using biomass is then maybe significantly cheaper but then it's also a decision where do I produce my hydrogen and maybe um, the ammonia, methanol, urea and so on. I need to come to the end, I think. Um, but there's another option. We not only can uh, produce hydrogen somewhere else in the world, but we also could say, why not producing chemical products, uh, the green steel or the fertilizers in another part of the world. That must not be my country, Germany. We will do everything to avoid that our industry will go away. But maybe that is a completely new chance for countries they have which have a good opportunity for hydrogen production that they don't stop with the hydrogen but they go for the chemical products, for the steel production and so on. And then we even might have in the high industrial countries a lower energy demand, a lower hydrogen demand than we have nowadays. But whether that comes really true, um, Maybe it's a question, do we really need the most, the best conditions of solar and wind? 
And you see here the map, uh, the best one is here in Atacama uh, from a solar point of view. But when we have a closer look, the best place in the world, I compare that with the worst place in my country, it's almost only a factor of two what PV can do there. It's just a factor of two. And when I go, for example, then look into the oil reserves and look which countries have half the reserves of the best location in the world, and the best location is Venezuela, and there's only a few countries who have half, uh, at least half of the reserves. It's Canada, it's Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Iraq, and all the other countries have less than half the reserves of Venezuela. And uh, same with natural gas reserves, it's Russia with the biggest ones, and it's only Iran and Qatar who have half the reserves. So the situation is less critical uh, for solar and wind when we look all over the world. And then there are other things. Uh, what about the central bank interest rates? Where do I want to invest my money? Do I really want to go at the moment uh, to take a loan in Argentina where I have interest rates of 100%? And there Europe, for example, is always a very cheap country for money. Also that might play a role. And then I come to the stakeholders. Sorry for the picture, but always when somebody talks about stakeholders, I have someone in mind uh, holding a stake in uh, his hand or her hand. Um, and then it's just a question, is the countries, for example, like Chile, willing to invest in those hydrogen economies? Is they are willing to replace the industries we have in Europe and bring them here to the South America? And looking to, again, that was artificial intelligence. I asked artificial intelligence to draw a rich immobile society guy, full and tired, unwilling to accept change and preservation of the status quo, and that was the result uh, the artificial intelligence was producing. We have uh, in Central Europe a high uh, willing to keep what we have and not to invest in change. And that also might a reason how maybe something will develop in a different way than our pure technical analysis will go for. And we have a lot of actors uh, who are unwilling to change things uh, in our society. And then I end up with another interpretation from playground artificial intelligence, also interpreting the title of my talk. I really don't understand uh, what that is here, but I think that is the power to X production facility. But I like a bit uh, the interpretation because there are so many roads and maybe these are the options we have uh, to have the power to X economy in the future. So thank you very much for your attention. for this very comprehensive and somehow critical uh, uh, talk. So do we have questions, comments? We have a question uh, from online audience, if you will allow at this point. Uh, so from uh, Luciana Calvan. Uh, what do you think about the environmental and social concern about the exploitation of lithium in Latin American communities for the manufacture of batteries? Oh, a difficult question. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, it's a big chance for those countries uh, to be part of the big battery uh, demand that we have, a big chance for the societies to have the profit out of it, even a much bigger profit when they not only supply the lithium, but would also go into battery production because then there is really the added value. And then there is always the topic about the high water consumption one needs with the lithium. And then there is where my knowledge stops. How does the water demand really affects what I need for the lithium production? Or is it the salty water in the salt lakes that is not used for the drinking water? I think that maybe the local people here better can um, evaluate than I can do. Uh, Yannick? 
Hi, Ingo. Thanks for your great talk. Yannick from New Zealand. Um, you touched about many topics, but I wanted to circle back on CO2 and fuels. <laughs> um, not for my Porsche that I don't have, but for example, for airplanes or sea shipping. Um, so we need carbon. I need to capture that carbon somewhere to make it carbon neutral. Um, what's the view of putting that carbon underground and just store it away forever? or using that carbon to actually make this in fuels versus the alternatives of biofuels or carbon credits. What, what's your take on those three options? Maybe we need all of them, could be an answer. Maybe we need also these e-fuels for the aircraft transportation, why not? And maybe we also need to get rid, I'm not that optimistic anymore that we can keep the 1.5 degree target we soon maybe will get over that and we get a long way until we have a carbon neutral society and in that way we even need to get for negative emissions. And then I think there are a lot of things, growing forests, maybe reducing a lot of concrete and building buildings by wood, uh, maybe even having a lot of other woods, replacement of concrete uh, even in wind turbine applications. So a lot of things that we made avoid for negative CO2 emissions. I think we cannot uh, only build on one option. Yeah, just to punctuate my question, um, if I already captured that CO2, I'm inclined to just put it away on the ground forever. Why doing the detour through thin fuels? Why, why not do why, why doing the detour to thin fuels? If I already have to capture carbon and I want to put it away. Uh, I, d I really not, d maybe that is again then a business case question, uh, whether it's, it could be cheaper investing in carbon capture and then bury it away or really using it then, because we need to have an alternative also for aviation fuels and so on. So, yeah, okay. I think we need no, no, both. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure. Thanks. Other questions, comments? I, I wanted to ask, um, before, before the other questions, um, we understood that you're kind of critical with the hydrogen pathways, but which, imagine that we still have uh, hydrogen, which would be your um, best priority for uh, hydrogen application and, and, yeah. and the, the worst one? Yeah, I think uh, it's when we agree that we need to become carbon neutral, I think there are even some people who say, oh, we don't need. But when we agree on that, there are some um, pathways that do not have an alternative. Then really, we have an alternative less option that is hydrogen, like in the chemical industry, like in the fertilizer production, uh, like in the green steel, when we need the green steel, and so on. And there, we really need it from a process point of view, and that, I think, is where we immediately can start with because we do not have an alternative. When we say, oh, in future we will drive with fuel cell cars, then maybe it's a risky investment when a country decides, oh, we built up a hydrogen filling station network. And then it turns out, hmm, but the battery electric cars make the race. And then you have a lot of stranded investments. And of those, wherever we have alternatives, I see always a high risk going in this hydrogen uh, direction. But I would really start with chemical industry, steel industry, fertilizer industry. Thanks. Uh, there was a question there, I think. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really also appreciate the, uh, how critical uh, your presentation was. And I was wondering, when, when you show those curves, now taking a uh, systemic viewpoint, right? So mm -hmm. uh, decarbonization of the electricity sector and then whatever scenario comes, comes forward. To what extent does the future in, in expected increase in um, you know, a raw material extraction and use to power this whole thing mm -hmm. affect the, uh, you know, the, the expected decrease uh, of costs due to learning curves and so on. Is it taken, taken into account in those scenarios? And uh, no, okay. It's not taken into account. And sure we know whenever we go away from burning uh, fossil fuels uh, and using resources like sun and wind that we have, 
we go uh, in another cycle and we use a lot of raw materials to build up the wind turbines, the solar cells, the fuel cells and so on. And therefore it's really necessary that we get into a circular economy because when we just build and throw away, that is the next problem we are running in. The good thing is when we burn coal, the coal is gone. But when we produce a wind turbine, we got, got in a circular economy and then we have that forever or almost forever. But uh, for sure, maybe that might be, there also might be some materials getting scarce and that might also destroy price development decrescence. Yeah, maybe. Um, thanks. So we are running a bit uh, over time, so I won't take any more questions, but feel free to ask uh, Ingo uh, at, at the break. So I want to say a big thank you again for thank the presentation. <laughs>